Hello, and welcome to the Kunstler Cast. Thanks for being here. Some of you may be aware that I've been associated with the new urbanist movement for about 20 years, uh, which uh, was founded around the same time that my 1993 book, The Geography of Nowhere, came out by a kind of coincidence. Their annual conference took place in Salt Lake City a week ago. They meet in a different city every year, but this was the year for Salt Lake City. And it was one of the few I've passed on. Uh, As I'm counting down the days to neck bone surgery, I'm feeling a little bit too uncomfortable for long-distance travel, so I passed on it. But we'll hear a bit about that meeting now from Andres Duani, one of the founding board members of the Congress for the New Urbanism. Andres is a principal of the DPZ Architectural Practice in Miami with his wife, Elizabeth Platter Zyberg, who's the dean of the University of Miami Architecture School and Urban Planning School. And uh, they are the designers, most famously, of the new urbanism's iconic first project, the new town of Seaside, Florida. The people listening to this podcast don't know that the Congress for the New Urbanism had its annual meeting in Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. And Salt Lake City was, uh, seemed to be kind of a problematical venue mm-hmm. because it's one of those western cities where the streets are too wide and the buildings are too low and, and the urbanism is so poor generally. And, and a lot of that comes from sort of the cultural background of the, you know, the Mormon settlement and everything. Um, how did that actually work? for the meeting, being in a, well, in a place uh, like that? you know, the new urbanism works at lots of different levels. And um, while the center is fixed, which is the charter, uh, you know, everything else, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just different, different layers of, uh, of observation of what works and what doesn't. And uh, whatever you think of the Mormons and of Salt Lake City, they did lay out within 50 years 536 towns and cities, none of which failed. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things they do well and uh, is the, the laying out of towns and cities. Uh, compare that to the usual Western experience of, of uh, uh, ghost towns everywhere. And, of course, they had a very harsh environment as well, the desert. Yeah. So what we were interested in is the methodology of doing things, getting things done, and furthermore, with very little cost because they were impoverished immigrants, you know. Mm-hmm. And what was relevant about the Mormon experience was that they, you know, let's take the year 1874 as a midpoint of their of their um, town building experience, and you realize that 1874 could be pretty similar to 2014, in the sense that a banking system might not be operating, uh, in the sense that you have to be clever as hell because things are against you, you know, the climate in their case, mm-hmm. and in the sense that. Um, that it's all about software, you know, uh, the software of the Mormon grid. And, and, and by that, you don't mean computer software. You mean the, the kind of cultural software of uh, a group of people. Well, actually, it used to be called smarts. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you apply smarts. Uh, it isn't just the physical layout, which is what I think most people think we do. And so the Mormons were at least were, uh, were, were their protagonists, not for their present city, you know, Salt Lake City, however successful it is, by some measures, but their past, you know, their their heyday, as it were, when they were running their own empire. By the way, you know, I mentioned 536. Uh, if you go to 1930, it's actually 740 towns and cities that they laid out. You know, Brigham Young was the Henry Ford of, um, of urbanism. There's nothing like it. Not the British Empire. I mean, nothing. Nothing like not the Roman Empire. There's nothing like the Mormons in terms of town building. And I think that was what we were interested in. How do they do that? Well, how do you get from uh, Mormon urbanism of the uh, mid to late 19th century uh, to the Western template of, you know, the standard Western suburban sprawl, which they seem to be pretty afflicted with? Yeah. Well, um, I think that the issue is Um, subsidiarity, you know, the level at which decisions were made in a kind of centralized and decentralized way. Subsidiarity is a theory that says that decisions should be made by the smallest possible group at the most local level at the latest possible time. 
Mm-hmm. And while Brigham Young himself would, for example, decide that there would be a continental uh, attempt, you know, to lay out an empire in that case, uh, the decisions were made actually by agronomists, you know, and then subsequent to that, uh, there was a template that said you must plant by, you know, the second week of spring and that kind of thing. But in general, the decisions were local. And I think what happened to the Mormon situation, and of course, there were tremendous, I mean, these cities, uh, um, uh, Jim, were actually known until the 1940s to be extraordinarily beautiful. Can you imagine that? Yeah, it's a little hard to tell from uh, having been there recently, because it, yeah. it doesn't look that different from Sacramento or Fresno. Yeah. Well, what happened is that then they lost their, the, the, uh, the ability to decide locally, and they downloaded the American suburban software. You know, once the Mormons decided to become Americans, which they were more or less forced to, you know, at the turn of the last century, mm-hmm. they became hyper-Americans. You know, very hot, you know, very patriotic, very high uh, incidents in the military, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And among the things they did was they, they took on the patriotism of American suburban sprawl. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, they just took it a lock, lock, stock, and barrel. And so they have been getting progressively less distinguishable from the rest. They also started we- out with... Uh, 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 a template of streets that were extraordinarily wide everywhere. Right. Well, and, and that kind of uh, helped get them right to, into the sprawl program pretty seamlessly. But, you know, the idea of the wide street, the 160-foot you know, street, uh, was that the actual pavement would be laid out by the trajectory of the wheels. So within the very wide right-of-way, there was actually a very gentle, meandering, circumstantial um, pavement uh, with trees and so forth and ponds and drainage in it. So what we now see, until then they got paved from end to end in the 50s, but what we now see as the most rigid of the urban grids of the West was actually the most charmingly irregular of the rectilinear grids because the, the pavement within them was actually... As I said, you know, uh, they just reached the houses where the houses existed, and they didn't where they didn't, and the, the wheel, you know, if there was some event that required a larger, you know, turnaround or something, then the pavement got, got wet, wide only there. So uh, the original presentation of that wide street was exactly the opposite. It wasn't an inch wider. The pavement wasn't an inch wider than it needed to be. So it's been completely reversed in its perception. That's why the towns used to be so charming. And so brutal now is when they downloaded the traffic engineering manuals and say you must drain everything and pave end to end, they lost it. Uh, the, the Mormons have shown an interesting eagerness and willingness to reconsider fundamental points of how we're going to arrange life in the future. I know they hired one of the new urbanist founders of the CNU, Peter Calthorpe, to do a transportation plan for them yep. about 10 yep. years ago. Yep. Um, what are they doing now? Well, uh, we followed up. Uh, designing the towns within his regional transportation plan. We followed up designing the towns within them at the next scale. And that is how I know, uh, and of course we studied very closely. You know, we were regionalists essentially. We studied the city of Zion uh, documents and we began to see them apparently for the first time in a very long time, what, how they worked and how resilient they were, how flexible they were, how inexpensive they were. And just to give you an example, you know, the famous Mormon block which is the largest in America, you know. So the uh, urban block we're talking about. The urban block, yeah. The urban block can be set, subdivided every which way. Like, for example, you can take a Mormon block and cut it into six New York blocks, or you could cut it into uh, nine uh, Portland blocks, or you could cut, you know, you could take it, keep the exterior uh, hard, you know, the, the edge, edge streets, and make a suburban cul-de-sac a la Orange County inside, or, or fit a university within it. So it turns out that the rigidity of this, the vaunted rigidity of the Mormon block is actually a method of subsidiarity that allows others to decide what to do within them to an extraordinary extent. And you take, you know, you take, for example, the, the, the Portland block that we love, uh, the new urbanist love because it's 200 by 200 feet. Well, very nice, but you can only do two things with it. You know, you can put four buildings on it or two buildings on it or one building on it, and that's it. 
there's no further subdivision possible. There's no, they're extraordinarily rigid. Uh, and so the presentation that I continually made was what an extraordinary uh, model this was for the future in terms of uh, successional development. You know, you start with, uh, you know, with very crude little streets. You start with uh, adobe houses, and you end up with a great city. Uh, because, of course, you have no wealth at the beginning, and it is the urbanism itself that creates the wealth. So you reserve, as it were, the site for the temple. The temple wasn't there at the beginning, but they reserved the site because they knew that someday it would be a wealthy. Ha- have they, in fact, managed to subdivide some of their giant urban blocks? Yes, they have. Yes, they have. And do they have plans uh, to do more of that? Well, uh, they used to do it, as a matter of course. Uh, but in such a matter-of-fact way that it takes somebody l- like a new urbanist looking for it, uh, not as something of the past, but as something of the future. What it does is the you know the new urbanist lens basically rediscovered this. Yes, they have been getting subdivided. Now, most of them have been relatively ungracefully subdivided, particularly recently. Uh, you wouldn't know because it's not done very with a great eye. But in the old days, they were done really quite nicely. And... Uh, and we demonstrated, you know, these projects we did within the Calthorpe plan. Uh, we did an old city of Zion plat, and then we had different designers subdivide them in extremely graceful ways, giving a great deal of choice to people. You know, some people might want to farm, some people might want to live in a kind of little quasi Manhattan of townhouses. All that is possible. Uh, and it isn't actually with, the, let's say, the Portland block. Have they done anything to get the transit part of that program underway? Salt Lake City itself has a tremendous transit system. Uh, you know, it seems to me just by observation, they don't, it's hard to tell because the Mormons don't brag. They're afraid of bragging. It gets them, makes them unpopular. But uh, there's a transit system, and those who wrote it said it was absolutely the most luxurious streetcar system they've ever been on. And one of the things that you begin seeing when you get, when you start looking around, is that what they've been building in the last 10 or so years is absolutely first rate. Uh, granite everywhere, beautiful concrete when it has to be concrete, great light rail. It seems that the, the LDS, the church, has decided to invest for the long term. Mm-hmm. I don't think that in the 50s or 70s they avoided the American uh, infection of uh, low-grade disposable suburbia, you know, low-grade sub- disposable buildings. They they went with it, but they seem to have recovered uh, at least, you know, that which is under the control of, you know, the the powers there to be very, very high quality. Now, I'm not saying some of it isn't kitsch. You know, they, they, they have a certain... You know, it's it's uh, it's the Southwest, and it's uh, a lot of it's new money, but it's beautifully built. You mm-hmm. know, beautifully built. There's a solidity to the transit system and to the sidewalks and so forth. The new sidewalks that are really it's really awesome. 